Hi, Digital Devils community and devils in general. Welcome to the education bubble. My name is Fernando Garibay. I'm with the Garibay Institute and Center. And this is my co-host and panelist as well, a combination, uh, Rebecca Huang. Uh, she is, I, I'd rather you give your intro because I'm going to butcher it and you're so prolific. So I'll let you keep this off. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone in Davos and everyone else who's watching. My name is Rebecca Huang. I'm a professor of practice at the Sat Thunderbird School of Global Management, and I lead a center on uh, global entrepreneurship and family business there. Fantastic. So I, I, uh, I gave my background earlier, but I'm a hit maker. I make hit records with pop, star, pop stars, and I also teach creativity as a skill to global leaders across uh, different disciplines from academia to uh, corporate to uh, uh, finance uh, and healthcare, etc. Uh, joining us as well is uh, Kenneth. Uh, feel free to uh, jump on and uh, give us uh, your, your story. Hey, everyone. I'm Kenneth. Um... I'm a co-founder at the Residency, which is an education-based startup. Um, we are creating a college alternative. Um, the, the, the main aim is to give debt-free college education to everyone globally. Um, I'm based out of SF, but right now in Singapore. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, Rupal? Rupal Shah, yes. Good to meet you. Uh, I'm an ed tech entrepreneur for the last 15, 20 years, uh, primarily in the education space. Um, with a lot of experience and expertise in AI machine learning and using those tools to help administrators uh, improve student outcomes. Great. Uh, and so we're expecting, who else do we have on here at the moment? Okay, great, fantastic. So we'll get we'll kick this off. You know, this is called the education bubble. You know, there's there's quite a, a a significant amount of renaissance happening across different disciplines, and for me, um, you know, I, I'm an autodidact, so so I I learned uh, by literally hacking curriculums and and using audio as as a way of of understanding the world and and uh, formal pedagogy and what I call casual pedagogy, right? As we are now in a space of where we can learn most of our uh, content uh, via content. Content. And so I'm curious to um, ask the panel, especially particularly starting with Rebecca Huang, who's on the forefront of education, uh, Stanford and, and uh, uh, Thunderbird, et cetera. How do you see, I'm going to jump right in with the idea of short form content and the future of education. Do you see an interplay happening well now? And then what's the future version of online versus formal curricula? Yes, we have seen a major shift in uh, the trends of information uh, transfer and consumption, and that has already been reflected in the way we educate our students and the way they prefer to uh, learn and absorb new information. So in typical classroom settings, if you give the option to uh, a student to just use textbooks and traditional conventional ways of learning, which is classrooms and written materials, um, they will lose their attention very quickly these days, and the new generations will prefer to have multimedia. They will like uh, absolutely short film, uh, video format, even to write their essays. And now with Metaverse, AR, VR, we will see a lot more influence of a lot of these technologies uh, in the classroom. We wonder what's going to happen with uh, AI specifically. We've been all watching uh, what's been happening with uh, chat GPT and this could really revolutionize the way uh, both teachers, educators, and students uh, think about uh, the role of technology in their education process. It's so interesting because when we look at uh, ChatGPT, right, I was talking about this earlier as far as kind of, you know, what, so Ray Kurzweil postulated a, a, quite a while back about the singularity point, and we're now at kind of the early stages of the first singularity point in which uh, AI specifically can outperform us in traditional logic easily, right? Uh, in, in in so much so that the prediction next year and the years coming forward is that traditional logic will seem to be antiquated, right? In the way we think about philosophy, et cetera. Um, and, and so that's what's interesting. So, but one thing that AI is showing us right now in the earlier stages is where it's really behind is in music, right? So it still allows human, cor you know, human cur curation um, on, on uh, trying to figure out uh, how to make content connect limbically, right? Like it still can't, it still needs humans to help that happen, which is very comforting, but also discomforting at the same time, because that can be also solved to a certain extent algorithmically. But what can be solved, and this is my argument, is 
A, although AI will, will also support us in, 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 in my philosophy is collaborative, right? Collaborative growth, collaborative um, uh, uh, externalities, collaborative output from human beings. What it still I don't see quite happening is the human experience, right? You know, uh, Jordan Peterson said something great uh, uh, recently. He said he said that we found really interesting. F uh, five years from now, universities will be outperformed, right? Like you, you, you will not need and to go to university to get a higher education. But, but here's the problem with that. The problem with that is the human experience, right? What you get from sitting in a room, having a mentor, having someone um, autodidactically, sorry, um, um, Aristilian uh, exchange, right? There's something that happens when you sit in a room with a professor or, or, or a higher um, knowledge community uh, that it's still difficult to replicate, right? Although MOOCs and um, online cur curricula has gotten us this far and, and has helped uh, create a level the playing field to access to knowledge, there's still something I quite, quite um, grasp and capture um, and it, versus the online and interpersonal relationship and exchange. Yeah, and I think we'll see more hybrid models. And I would love to ask Kenneth this question because outside of the formal settings that we have with universities and institutions, uh, Kenneth, you know, you have been thinking really hard about the evolution and the trends that will create opportunities for these uh, outside of the classroom experiences. So tell us more about what you've been building. Yeah, absolutely. So at the residency, what we're building is essentially a college alternative model. And the main premise is that we are going to train people to interact, give them a college campus of sorts to interact. So there, there is that social interaction, but there is no cohort-based classroom setting um, lessons and lectures. The main premise is there is, um, instead of, instead of, a horizontal bar in terms of teaching, uh, standardized teaching across the board and standardized learning. There is a certain understanding um, where people people reach understanding at different paces. So mastery based learning is the main concept which we are behind. Essentially, learning is learning is done through stages, and you need to hit a certain level of mastery of certain base concepts before you can advance to the next one. And people do that at different paces. So if so the main, um, the main thesis behind what we're building is that if we can give one-to-one -one, um, um, coaches and individualized learning to people and they learn at their own pace, then we can let them progress very quickly to the top instead of everyone spending the same amount of time on the same topics when some people clearly have better mastery and some people don't. Um, and the comments earlier was super interesting in terms of like the, the, um, the space MOOCs and all these different uh, AI tools that have been developed over time, because I think if you break down the learning space, um, the first layer is you know access to information. The internet solves some of that, and then ChatGPT obviously uh, solves a bit more of that. Um, the next layer is curation of material that's like curriculum bu building and just putting the right material in the in structure in the structure order so that people can access it. And then afterwards, from that point onwards, you need a bit more social elements where it's social accountability to keep you on track. A, a sports coach, uh, someone like an accountability partner, keep you on track. And then the last layer is individualized coaching, where I think that in the typical setting, you would be going to lecturers after lecture to ask certain questions or blockers to your understanding. Um, the third and fourth layer are what we're trying to address in our alternative model to education. Thank you so much, uh, Kenneth. And I do want to now welcome also another panelist, uh, Dr. Sanjeev Kagram. Hi, welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. How are you, dear Rebecca and everyone? Doing great. So, uh, Dr. Kagram. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, Dr. Kagram is the Dean of uh, the Thunderbird School of Global Management, and uh, he's also the founder of the 100 Million Learners uh, Initiative. So tell us more about how this uh, project is going to uh, provide access to a lot of learners uh, out in the world who don't traditionally have access to uh, formal education and tertiary education. Uh, uh, Dr. Um, Kagarin, we can't hear you. Are you still on? 
Let's see if this works. There, Can you hear me now? Yeah, there you go. It's breaking up a little bit. I apologize. A little bit of a terrible internet connection. Um, if you could repeat the question, and thank you all for organizing this fabulous event. My apologies for being a little late and the connection being not so great. No problem at all. We, we're so happy to have you. Uh, one of the themes on uh, this panel is providing access to education to those who cannot afford it. So we wanted to learn more about the 100 Million Learners Initiative. For sure. Thank you so much. Well, let's start with the magnitude of the challenge uh, and the opportunity. Let's be positive because we are <laughs> internal optimists. There's 3 billion people on the planet uh, looking for quality education at all levels. Uh, there are 440 million people uh, searching for higher education opportunities. And that means uh, that we have several challenges. Number one is there's no way we can build infrastructure, school universities. Sorry, we're, we're losing the connection there. Um... We we uh we'll come back uh, to Kagram. I, I really want to hear his, his opinion on this because it's so it's so hyper relevant, right? If we think about higher education, I'm going to jump back to Kenneth. Your comments for a second. Uh, you you know what's really interesting is that we look at uh, the history. Sorry, uh, Dr. Kagram, we, we just want to make sure that your connection is, is stable here. Um, we'll check back in. Um, Kenneth, you're interesting on your on your platform where you're working on is you know you mentioned about uh the 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 uh, the the parameters in which you're applying education and, and from your reset and uh, what what's interesting is you know I'm a big fan of Robert Asiagioli uh and, and Montessori in which you you know you meet with the pace of where the students are and then um, inspire through passion and 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 move and and their um, and steer and guide and nudge etc right and then you have also Aristilian's first principle right understanding fundamentals have you have you um have, were you conscious of, of their work as you thought about your platform? Can I? Yeah, yeah. Definitely. So one big part about um, well, one big part about how traditional education has been structured, Montessori is an exception. Um, and they are they they I mean they're very young. Um, one big part about like the difference between I think traditional education and what we're trying to build is we are really small, and so we 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 have the flexibility to um to to build it from the ground up without having any of the um, infrastructure set in place since the like 1900s or before. And a significant part of the, the literature on education and how like people have been learning has been developed over the last 50 to 70 years. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the principles, um, for example, Richard Feynman's um, principles on how to learn anything, that's something we are very keen on. And um, there's a lot of material out out there on how to learn that has only been widely published in the last couple of years. So there is a lot of advancement in terms of the thinking that we can incorporate, which might take a lot long, might take a lot more work to incorporate in like bigger institutions. Yeah, equally, you know, so I'd love to get uh, RuPaul, your, your opinion on this, you know, the, 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 the philosophy has not changed much, but the access to knowledge has, right? Um, and this, this is what I what I find most exciting. Rupal, what, what's your opinion on 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 where we're heading towards as far as accessibility? Um, it, it, is it get it? Is it becoming more more accessible for individuals to pursue their passions through online education and 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 what you're you're inspired by at the moment? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a lot of uh, great organizations. Kenneth is, is, has one, and others, uh, Sanjeev, that are building these. Uh, constructs to be able to deliver information, deliver, uh, you know, uh, an ability to master skills. The work around AI machine learning, the work that I do largely is around pattern matching. And so what it typically does is it takes something like an old guard university system and tries to find ways and in, in pathways for students so that they can get through it in a faster rate, a more successful rate. But again, that's looking at historical data and then projecting what the future is going to look like. All that said, I think with all these other organizations and all these experiments that are going on, you have lots of institutions, competency-based, they've kind of deconstructed the curriculum. There's pedagogical learnings with AR, VR, et cetera. AI and machine learning is going to help understand over time with that historical data works, what works well for individuals. So instead of worrying about 
curriculum for 20,000 students, we're going to get to an N of one. So this is going to be very personalized and specific to an individual. And so it's going to take somebody like Kenneth and Sanjeev and other organizations to create the ability to consume this information, which I think will get cheaper and cheaper over time. It's, it's definitely not uh, affordable for everyone. But AI and machine learning will play a role in making it specific. And this is part of the bigger theme of this shift from centralization to decentralization. We all saw that over the last 15 years with the likes of Amazon, Uber, Airbnb, disrupting old guards and putting the user at the center. I think we're in that period right now where we're developing the tools and technology and it'll start to accelerate very rapidly as we start to see this progress. Uh, Sanjay, feel free to jump in at any time uh, as your as your condition gets uh, stable. I want to ask a very difficult uh, question because it's on top of my mind. I'm sure it's on the top of a, a lot of people's mind. And, and that is what happens when the education access to education is completely leveled and 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 equal right so when you think about like high performance right and our performers and you know uh leaders in their spaces respectively like is it become an evolutionary question as to who like what happens when we now everyone has access which which is good but also has like um a higher hierarchical um potential interpretations, right? So so where, where do you see the future of accessibility and then performance uh, as far as a whole? And that's a challenging question. So so anybody wanna jump in on that one? Well, maybe I could try. Can you hear me uh, yes, now? Yes, there you go, yeah. Okay, so just to finish up then very quickly on Harmony yeah. Learners, and it does connect to your question, is right now we need to focus on access. <laughs> we can handle uh, the, you know, <laughs> you know, the hierarchy issues and the performance issues as we address the access issues. As I very quickly said, 3 billion individuals seeking just quality education, 440 million uh, seeking higher education. There are four critical challenges. Number one is the education is either, is both not the skill sets, the fluencies, the capabilities that people need for the 21st century global economy. And we're not doing it, and as Kenneth was saying in Rupal, in customized ways, in ways that are appropriate to where they need and how they learn and so forth. The second is that, and, and a big part of that number two is languages. We have a tendency to provide high quality education and global languages that makes it unaccessible to the vast majority of humankind. The third, of course, is where Rebecca started her question to me, which is cost, is cost. And so that, of course, excludes the vast majority of humankind. So, and then the, the fourth is, of course, the nature of lives, people's lives. Not everyone can go to a structured school and, or a university and be able to take time off and so forth. So what we've tried to do with the 100 Million Learners Initiative is address each one of these. It's no cost to the learner. It's 100% digital, self-paced, uh, you know, asynchronous. Uh, it's translated. It will be translated into 133 languages. And we've built out with Google the first ever in the world academic translation factory. And the quality of that is, you know, in romance, global romance languages and European languages, 98%, but in Swahili, Bahasa, Arabic, Hindi, and many others up to 133, we're at 93, 94%. Uh, and then finally, for it to be based on skill sets, fluencies that are really needed in not only today's but, uh, economy, but helping people to be future ready. Three programs, one for the global majority, 50 hours, a second one for advanced high school, early undergraduate students, and a third one for um, graduate students and beyond. And the idea really is that with this, the, the learners at no cost in their own language, at their own pace, but with the skill sets that they're gonna need will be empowered. And so this is really a massive disruption. And it goes back to RuPaul, what you were saying, you know, about all those, those platforms, whether it be Uber or, or so forth and so on, uh, you know, shared platforms. This is a disruptive, transformative uh, intervention in global education, and arguably uh, perhaps the most ambitious global education. And still, 100 million, very large number, is only 3% <laughs> of where we need to get to. I will say one other major piece of this is 70% women and young women and girls. 
And that's really critical to us because we know that that is transformative in terms of societies, economies, and uh, all of our lives. So that's the way we've been trying to do that. And we believe though, that will lead to new forms of thinking about performance, going back to your most yeah. uh, recent question, right? It's yes. gonna transform the notion of performance, educational performance and success and beyond. So, so it's like, you, you, what I, so what I understand is, is brilliant. So you, you're talking about a baseline raise, right? So at hundred million people, you have a, uh, a huge shift and upshift in, in access to knowledge, higher knowledge, and therefore potentially uh, uh, higher access to new ideas and, and, and also, you know, the evolution of our, of our, our, our species, right? The more intelligence there is out there, the more, the more innovation, the more, the more it's a systemic effect there. So, so it's very, very super inspiring. I take a note from as a comparison model, right? The the access now, uh, the the comparison to content, right, and the content generation, in which the question of our my industry, uh, the creative class specifically, is what happens when now everybody can record content from their home, uh, music, film, photography, etc., with a basic uh, technology with the laptop, right? And what happens is still the same same evolutionary thing it's the highest performance win right yeah. so it's really interesting if you take a note of that the more access you have to still there's still you still have to outperform the given market space in order to to achieve and cut through the the the, the masses as far as performance so i'm kind of indirectly answering my question that was very inspiring sajeev uh um Huang, uh, do you have any opinion on this as far as access? actually follow up on uh your comment about content uh, we're also shifting our views on what should be what should be taught during these courses and so i would like to mm -hmm. extend this question to the panel as well traditionally we uh, thought about teaching um, skills that can now be learned very quickly on uh, textbooks and, and online uh, but what are some of the more practical skills that the global majority uh, needs today to be able to face some of the challenges that the fourth industrial revolution are bringing to this planet uh, maybe we'll start with Dr. Kagram then Kenneth and then Robot. Yeah, thank you so much. And I'll be very brief because it, it's the full continuum. On the one hand, we still have challenges, <laughs> pardon me, just in basic digital literacy. And if we don't have to, we, we lost it, um, Sanjeev. I'm really riveted by, I, I can't wait to hear what you have. <laughs> there you go. Uh, um, okay, so, so, so I, I mean, I, I, I think I, I know where you might be going with this, is, but uh, we'll come back. Uh, Rupal, uh, Rupal, you want to give your opinion and we'll wait for uh, Sanjeev to jump in. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's uh, interesting that we're probably in a different phase where we we don't know what the fourth industrial revolution is going to look like. We don't know what the next jobs, it's, it's changing so rapidly. And this goes back to the earlier point I was trying to make around agency and giving the learner, the ability to kind of stylize and create their own curriculum in a way that is accredited and is still uh, important for the rest of the world. We all have to kind of look at this too, in terms of what, what abstraction is someone looking at education for? Are they looking for economic opportunity? Are they looking for mastery? Are they looking for a four-year party? Is it insurance policy? Everyone's looking at it for different reasons. And Fernando, what you were saying earlier about what if we level the playing field? Learning is great, but we also have to create the economic opportunity for somebody in Afghanistan to the U.S. And so I think there's another conversation that has to happen about once they have mastery, once they have learning, they have the ability to create content, to sell it, to earn an income and to do something with it. And I think that that's a for a different discussion for a different sure. day, but a super important piece of this puzzle. Yeah, well, you know, traditionally, you know, acad academia has um, has represented a certain level of uh, obviously extreme level of credentialization, right? And then it, by that, you have um, sociological, so 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 societal status equally, right? And then you have right. um, application of that education synthesis, and and then obviously market opportunity and uh, and, and market creation through academia and and its output, right? Um, so so. Um, uh, Dr. Professor Sanjeev, are you still on? Or is... I think he had to drop Okay, no worries. But Kenneth is still there, correct? I am. Yeah, so um, talk more about yeah, the focus of some of your residency programs and what is the content that you cover and why? 
Yeah, that's awesome. I, I'd like to cover um the 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 comment by uh, Fernando, which is which is a great question on like what's needed to to um what the kind of the skills needed for um educators and and like people who are learning going forward. I think there's two two like really important questions. One is um now that everyone has more access to education, learning how to learning how to ask the right questions is yep. increasingly important. You need to know what to Google, you need to know what to ask ChatGPT in order for you to get um the 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 right kind of content. And if we look back at like at least my schooling days personally, um a lot of what I was tasked to do is to get come up with answers rather than come up with questions. So thinking up questions is a is a real skill that's very important. And um I would argue more important in 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 a practical sense than than coming up with the answers. Um, and on another level, I think given that the rate of skills decay is increasing, so like the half-life of any skill now is around like 4.5 years. If that's the case, then um, learning how to learn very quickly is also another thing. And my personal view and the view of what we're building is that this is a very individualized and personalized process. You need to know what works for you and what doesn't. And tweaking it is what we want to help um, our residents do over time. So learning how to have the cognitive self-awareness to know like this is working for you, this doesn't work for you. For example, whether you're auditory learner or like visual learner, things like that, they they add up and they make a very big difference over the long run. You have a very modern perspective on 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 uh, knowledge acquisition and uh, and and curricula pedagogy formation in general, which which I am a, a follower of this philosophy of, you know, what works best. And we know, look, look at look at Harvard, right? And so on, uh, specifically HBS, which is really interesting. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's basically a derivative of Socratic method, right? Methodology, right? The, mm -hmm. the asking questions and challenging students rather than giving the answers. So so mm -hmm. so the highest performers in education, academia, are you know are, are prevalent on uh, Socratic method. The 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 Conscious self-awareness, right? So I argue that these four postulates are essentially uh, for the for the output of ex the next generation. Now that we are in the fourth industrial revolution, we actually are seeing what it's looking like, right? And there's a strength. There's a lot of attention if you just take uh, online uh, interest, right? Especially from learning is based upon arguably the understanding of EQ, right? Self-awareness, right? And 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 actually instinct intuition and the synthesis of all this information that we we learn we learn online is it, it, it is is creativity right it's mm. how, what do we do with this information mm. how creative are we at applying is leveraging ai where it's at now where it will be in the future to build businesses alongside mm. it uh so so I'm, I'm curious on everyone's opinion on this uh as we get into the um ai how do you think next generation is going to leverage ai alongside education is it collaborative or how collaborative is it in your opinion? So I um I love to leave this cliffhanger to our audience because this is one of the most important questions that mm. we'll have to discuss during Davos and beyond. We unfortunately run out of time. So I hope that this was a really good thought-provoking appetizer for all of us to keep thinking about how we can uh, continue uh, contributing to the evolution of education and uh, the acquisition of uh, practical skills increase access and affordability to all of us who want to uh, be able to have all the tools required to uh, face all of the challenges that we're facing today. Absolutely, it's super inspiring. Thank you to all our, our, our speakers. Uh, Rebecca, thank you for, for co-moderating this with me. Uh, uh, thank you to the Davos community.